Library of Adventure, featuring the great adventures of yesterday, dramatized for the boys and girls of today. Michael Strogoff, Courier of the Tsar. Chapter 22 of the story adapted from the novel by Jules Verne. While Michael Strogoff, Nadia Fedor and the two correspondents made their way slowly down the Angara on the raft, and at the precise moment when Michael realized the dreadful significance of the mineral oil floating on the surface of the river, two men were talking in the palace of the Grand Duke in the city of Irkutsk. One was the Duke himself, and the other his right-hand man, and the one responsible for the defense of the city, General Voranov. The richly panelled room in which they stood opened to a wide balcony, and from here could be seen the city spread below them. Bell towers, Steeples slender as minarets, canals and gardens, wide streets and flowering trees merged softly with the gathering twilight. The Grand Duke stared moodily across the city for a moment and then turned to his general. You say that the defences of the city are complete, General. As complete as time and ingenuity can make them, Highness. How long can we hold out? against a full-scale attack. We have uh, one regiment of Cossacks, a corps of police, besides several regular regiments of town folk armed as well as could be managed. We have ample food to withstand a long siege, and beyond a Kutsk lies a desert. The Tartars will have to forage widely to sustain themselves. It will make them all the more eager to reduce the city. Troops from the province of Yakutsk cannot hope to relieve us within the week. We can hold our Highness. If every man acquits himself as a soldier and a Russian. Look there. Do you see the campfires of the Tartars across the river? Fifty thousand men at least, under the most able captain of his generation, Feofar Khan. And the cruelest. We can expect no quarter if they breach our defences. I trust that none will be given. They will answer for my men, Highness. Uh, would you hear a deputation from the group of exiles within the city? Russians? Yes. I've armed them, and already they've proved their worth. What do they ask? Uh, they wish to form a special corps of their own and be placed at the head of the first sortie. They are Russians. It is their right to fight for their country. Have they a leader? And that is the reason they seek audience. They wish to appoint one of their number to the command. His name? Fedor. Vastly, Fedor. Fedor. Do you know anything of him? I would recommend him, Highness. He's a man of worth and courage. His influence over his companions has always been considerable. How long has he been at Irkutsk? Two years. His conduct? Above reproach. He has faithfully obeyed the laws which govern him as an exile from Russia. Vasily Fedor. Yes, I will meet the deputation. Would you be so good as to ask them to step this way? We will need men like Vasily Fedor when the Tartar arrives. Is this the work of the Tartars? I would say so. There are several reservoirs of oil on the banks of the river. If the walls were breached deliberately, the oil would flow naturally into the Angara. There seems to be nothing we can do, except warn the defenders of the city. But how? What is the time, Mr. Blunt? Uh, a, a few minutes to ten o'clock. Hmm. Apparently we haven't reached the outposts of the Tartar camp. Mr. Blunt, look there, down the river. Good heavens. Are they... are they Tartars? What do you see? Black objects, Mr. Korpanov, springing across the ice. They are wolves! Wolves? Mr. Jolivet, warn the boatman. Tell him to get the women and children into the center of the raft. The men must cover every approach. Use knives only. We daren't draw attraction to ourselves. I will. Nadia, 
Nadia, wake up. Oh, oh, oh Michael, oh, what is it? There are wolves on the river. Go to the center of the raft with the others. You will be safe there. Yes, Michael. Hurry, Nadia, and do all you can to keep them quiet. Any noise will have the Tartars down on us. Like a pack of wolves also. Is it usual for them to attack in this way, Mr. Kopernoff? Yes. But I'm afraid that we're going to be hard put to it to keep them out. Hunger and cold has sent them roaming through the province. They'll be savage. <coughs> That'll be the leader. They're like an army, these wolves. They fight in a pack led by the strongest. I've warned everyone to be ready. The men will fight with knives and clubs. I see you have a knife, Mr. Kopernoff. Surely you don't intend... I was a hunter before I was a courier, Mr. Jolivet. And I trust my hunter's instinct will be of some use. Guide me to the side of the raft. Yes. Just here, I think. Lie down on either side of me, gentlemen. I think we can hold the brutes off. This will make excellent copy, Monsieur Jolivet. Excellent, Mr. Blunt. Stand by me. The wolves are upon us. <laughs> <laughs> Never be done. We, we uh, seem to have slaughtered a, a hundred. Uh, and yet they're, they're still attacking. Not for the moment. Uh, Are you all right, Mr. Kovanov? Uh, yes. How you uh, manage it is beyond my comprehension. You slew at least a dozen of the brutes. And every one at the throat. It is an instinct, gentlemen, as I told you. I hope that we can hold off the next attack. We are all becoming weak, I think. One can only stand so much of this. At least we have given a good account of ourselves. Prepare yourselves, men. The wolves are coming at us again. Uh, I can uh, see the brutes. Hundreds of them. They're swarming across the ice. Come, Mr. Blunt. Let us do what we can to... Look. Look. They are running away. Fire. The Tartars have set a village on fire. On the left bank? Yes. The village of Poshkaps. Michael, we are saved. The light from the burning village has driven away the wolves. They won't attack in the light, however hungry they may be. Mr. Blunt, ask the boatman to steer close to the right bank. If we lie on the floor of the raft, we may pass the village unnoticed. Fortunately, the wind is blowing away from the river. Any one of those sparks could set the oil afire. We must trust in Providence. We will reach Akutsk. Getting thicker, Michael. Yes. The boatman says that in another hour we'll be held fast. Then we have still an hour in which to hope. And we shall be an hour nearer to Irkutsk. Oh, it is good to be with you, Michael. You make me feel that I shall see my father again. I have promised that you shall. Look ahead, Nadia. Does the river seem to narrow? No. There are high banks on either side of us now. Well, no matter. But if we should find a narrow defile ahead of us, then I'm afraid we shall have to leave the raft. Oh, but... but why? The ice is thickening. At the first narrow passage, it'll form a barrier through which the raft will have no chance of forcing away. If that happens, Nadia, take my hand and guide me across it. On the far side of the flow, we may find a block of ice large enough to carry us onwards. It will be dangerous, but it will be our only chance of reaching Irkutsk. And while there is still one chance left, I must take it. I will do it, Michael. You afraid? I have never been afraid, Michael. I have been hungry, yes. Exhausted, yes. But I have never been afraid. Well, I know it. If we go on at our present rate, at what time will we reach Irkutsk? About five in the morning. After that, it'll be light. And then we might be observed by the Tartars. Oh, Michael, I pray that we reach the city safely. If only I may see my father for a few moments. After that, I would not care. You will be with him, Nadia. <laughs> 
We are discovered! Get down, everyone! Lay down! Lay down! Nadia, this is our last chance. Take my hand and guide me across the ice barrier. This is our last chance to reach Irkutsk. So Michael Strogoff, the man of iron, risks his life yet again in the service of his master. And while Michael and Nadia struggle desperately on towards Irkutsk, what plans are being carried out by the traitor, Ogare, and his spy, Sangari? And how will Nadia's father, Vasily Fedor, fit into the pattern of this great adventure? Listen again when next we present Michael Strogoff, courier of the Tsar. <laughs> 